I want to dive right in, okay? There's a summary uh, uh, in the uh, PowerPoint that you can review, but I don't really want to discuss that. I just want to get into the presentation. Uh, that's where we'll be going, as covered in the summary. About to a conference, it was in Santa Barbara, California, and I was in a room with about 200 psychotherapists, and uh, the, uh, the, the featured presenter had been the director of clinical training for about 25 years in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, his name is Dr. James Hillman. He's a prominent Jungian analyst. And someone raised their hand in the, in the meeting and said, uh, Dr. Hillman, what do you see as central to the training of an effective psychotherapist? It's a very cool interaction. All these years like this, he responded like that without a moment's hesitancy and he said, uh, it's to cultivate your art form. And so I want to use that as kind of a central guiding metaphor to this conversation today about uh, what's important in becoming an effective psychotherapist. Um, well, let me ask you all that are here, plus out in radio land, what does what, what is cultivating your art form signify? What does it mean? What's, what's an art form? No. What's an art form? Monique. I think it's just uh, being true to your own uniqueness when you bring something to the table. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. whether it's how you think you're a person, how you have your own way of presenting your uniqueness. Yeah, that's right. Being true to that probably makes you as. Like that, that's great. That's great. Uh, you know, over the years, I've done a fair bit of training of students that are just beginning therapy. Thank you. That's great. Um, and one of the things that comes up, I bet you remember this, Christine, um, is um, when you start seeing your, when you start, what's that? Louder voice. <laughs> Louder voice. Um, when you start seeing clients, what you do is you forget how to be. And screen and begin tapping on it like, is anybody alive in there? <laughs> That's my friend. Um, it, you, you, for, you lose your power spot. You lose your orientation and feel like, well, I've got to sound like Carl Rogers or Donald Mike, whatever it is. And so your um, answer to what on the money money is like, how do, how do we remember to bring in who we are? Uh, it's what got us into this field to begin with. Virtually every one of us has had lots of training. Uh, in vivo and becoming a counselor, and then we get into graduate school and begin training to be a therapist, and we forget the one the pearl of great price, which is how to be ourselves. And so, yeah, I guess that's very much related to it. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Grant Gorman Hi, Grant. says that uh, it's understanding itself and letting it flow through you. Oh, that's a wonderful image. I have a story to tell you about that. I'm getting hooked up here, <laughs> or unhooked, as the case may be. You probably know this story. It's a story from Carl Jung Grant, and um, uh, in the latter years of his life, he was being interviewed by the BBC, and uh, he, uh, they were they were out walking along a stream uh, in uh, Kusnacht, where uh, Jung lived, and uh, the interviewer asked him. The interviewer asked him. The interviewer asked him. Um, what does he see as uh, the essence of psychotherapy? Dr. Jung, you've done all your work all these, you know, many years. He was in his 80s. I practiced all these years. And the story goes like this, Grant, is that Jung is, they're walking alongside a creek bed there on his property. I've been to this property before. I can actually picture the creek. And Jung stopped, went over to the stream. And Jung was a big man. He was about six foot four and very stout. Very, he was always a very robust physical figure. He's crouched down in the stream, put his hands underneath a very sizable boulder in the middle of the stream, picked it up out of the stream, dropped it on the riverbed, and kept walking. <laughs> it's a great image. It's a great image of the essence of psychotherapy. So what was it What was it that he said again verbatim? Um, he said, and by the way, his wife goes to counseling school at the university where he did that presentation. Um, what, what university? Sorry? 
at, at Pacific Gate. It was yes, it was James right. Hillman who did the presentation, oh, sorry, just to make sure that we were clear. And he said, understanding yourself and letting it flow through you. Yeah. Yeah. Jung's idea was that it, the key to psychotherapy is helping to unblock the client's stream. And I will come back to that as another image or motif. That's right on, Grant. That's right on. Great. What would, what would cultivating one's art form have to do with unblocking that stream, I wonder? Well, what is an art form? What are, what are, what are some art forms? Let's start with that. Do I have to be an artist to be a therapist? <laughs> <laughs> Music. Grant says music. Ah, oh, boy. A man after my own heart. <laughs> no. Melissa Ortiz says, I see art as related to psychotherapy as bringing to the table all of your skills. Mm -hmm. I think it's been a long time, but somebody could probably help me with this. The Latin root of the word art has something to do with skill, doesn't it? I can't remember so long. Like an artisan? I, I, this, that's good, Melissa. That's good. That's good. Uh, uh, Dr. Marofver says it's important to be creative. Um, and Sue Hunter, thank you. All my learners tell me that psychometrics is art. Oh, man, if you can teach psychometrics is art, you're doing very well, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's because there's because nothing, there's nothing that's, that's not art. art. Uh, uh, somebody, somebody uh, in fact, when, when Hillman was, 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 was presenting this, he said, and then he said, and by that, and by that I don't mean you have to be a painter or a drummer. I'm a drummer. You don't have to be a musician. He says, you, you can, can be a gardener, gardener. You, you can, can dance, dance. You, you can, can wash dishes, dishes mindfully, you, you can walk down the garden path, path with awareness. awareness. You, can, you, you just, you just, just went down, down the list. It, 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 it's, it's, it's not a thing, a thing that, you that you do. I actually, I actually don't, don't think like the psychotherapy is something that you do. I think it's, I think it's a sensibility as much as an activity. And I think that's what he's getting at. Art as a way of being. As a way of being. And the rest will follow that. So you begin to see. So you begin to see that if if training to be an effective psychotherapist uh, is, is, uh, is cultivating, is cultivating who, you are, who you are, how, well, if psychotherapy, if psychotherapy is, 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 is at least as much indebted, indebted to who you are, you are as what you know, what you do, what you do what you how important it is to establish that as the heart of education. Over the years, Over the years of teaching, of teaching, I've had many students, Christian, 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 I, mean, I, figure I would always how much I would, time I would figure out how much time students should, 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 should spend in reading so that we could right so do it with the shock but, right, uh, up right up front. That I don't but, say, uh, and that I still believe that I'm saying it in teaching that I'm doing these days, is that it's as important that you have a life, that you have a life, that you have a life. And if you need to go up to the mountains one day and come in class, I'd rather you not lie to me and make an excuse. Just tell me that's what you're doing. I will grade fairly. If somebody's present if, versus if somebody's not, present versus at the end of the day, the of the day maybe, it's the maybe it's the mountain trip that we remember, that we as, remember much as, as much as that lecture, particular lecture, glowing that it was, glowing that it was by Dr. Weather. Dr. Weather. <laughs> that one, that one, that's really, really important to have balance, that, and, I and I wanted to grant blessing to that always. Right up front. And so I have over the years teaching, I've had students, I'm going up to Mammoth and I want to know, and unabashedly, that it's as important, at least. Anyway. Do we have more people making some questions? I love this technology. <laughs> Um, Glenn, Glenn tells us that uh, he believes in integrating your life block with the therapy. Yes, absolutely, Glenn. And uh, Grant continues in saying that it's seeing the beauty in everything and treating and sorry, it's seeing the beauty in everything and treating the whole with respect that it deserves. And Kathleen, that's good. Says, that's good. I think Kathleen says I think art has to do with the expression of the unique individual. That reminds me of what Monique said. That's right on. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> There's a great poem. I just remembered it. Uh, it relates to the some if I can remember it. Because it's, it's about, about uniqueness. uniqueness. God, God picks, picks up the reed flute world and blows. And each note is a need coming through us, a passion, a longing pain. Remember the lips where the wind breath originated. And, and let, let your note be clear. clear. Be your, your note. note. Don't, Don't try, try to, to end, end it. it. 
be, be your, your note, I'll show you it's enough. enough. That's the point. <coughs> and um, one last one. one um, uh, uh, I think you guys are Jim. James, please. Please resolve. If psychotherapy is an art form, then to do psychotherapy means engaging in a creative process of self-expression. You are reading my, my mind, mind, sir. <laughs> 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 I'm so really great. Uh, uh, my, my next question, question is going to be, why am I to advise to cultivate one, uh, one's art form? Why might it be important, in addition to what we've been talking about, which is about cultivating one's individuality, a certain kind of way of being? And my next note here, which is in the PowerPoint, is looking at psycho... Were you cheating? <laughs> <laughs> is psychotherapy as creative a process? Uh, there are many metaphors uh, for, for, looking uh, for looking at psychotherapy, and especially and these days, there's been so, so much, so much um, 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 honing, uh, honing uh, ways, uh, of ways of empirically studying, studying psychotherapy. psychotherapy. I won't get, I won't into get off into the blocks right now, that would be another, another day. day. But, but um, I want to look, I wanna look at, at a different entry point in psychotherapy with complete, with complete respect, respect to the empirical. empirical. I'd like to go non-empirical, and I'd really like to go phenomenological or into the inner experience of psychotherapy, and look at the literature of there is a uh, fair, fair literature, literature in psychology, psychology of creative process. process. Look, Look at, at that, that literature for how it might suggest not only how we do psychotherapy, but mm -hmm. even how we begin to uh, study and incorporate and train to be psychotherapists ourselves. I want to refer to uh, Carl Jung uh, here at the get-go. Carl, Carl Jung is a very interesting, interesting figure. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was an undergraduate, I went to a, a, a program that focused on learning, learning theories, theories. And, and so the, 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 the twin, twin Satan, the twin, the twin devils, devils, were Sigmund, Sigmund Freud, Freud and Carl, Carl Jung. Jung. <clears throat> and, and so, so I, really I really just assumed that they were idiots. idiots. And then I took, and then a, I took a course in his systems in my senior, senior year in college, uh, in college and, was and was required to read, to read a lot of Freud, Freud and, and a lot of Jung and a lot of Maslow. Maslow. I, will I will never forget my experience. I really, really like uh, uh, the scales falling from my eyes. I read Freud and even 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 the specific content may have been outdated or whatever. He was such a genius. It was so obvious. He was so knowledgeable across so many disciplines. And I I just like shame on him. Forever, forever having, having thought any less than that, for not having read him. Well, if it was the case with him, it was, him, it was at least as much case with Carl Jung. Jung. Carl Jung was, was a master of, of he was a world, world master of several, several disciplines, uh, a huge student of mythology, certainly the world's expert during his life, in addition to being a psychotherapist and an author on the world's symbolic traditions, he knew world religions, and beyond that, just a symbol across all traditions. Uh, uh, all, all continents, all hemispheres, as much as anybody on the planet. planet. This was an extraordinary scholar. About uh, 10 years, years ago, I went, went to Jung's home uh, on, a, on a Lake Zurich there, and it's amazing to walk into it. It just turned out I was on a study tour with the Jung Institute here in Los Angeles, and somebody knew his grandson. They don't let people come. And it just, it was one of those things where we were there just kind of like look at it from a distance and they invited us in. I will never forget this. I will never forget this. There's still bookshelves There's in this still home with all of his books on it. It's amazing to me. They're just, his, just, and the literature, the, and the literature multiple is multiple languages. Multiple languages Greek, Latin, Greek, Latin, French, German, German Italian, Italian, English. It's English, just it's unbelievable. Just unbelievable. And, uh, and uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to touch them. It felt disrespectful. But I had every conviction that those books were full of markings and edits, kinds of comments, where he would wherever he would go. This is the this kind of thing he, he was. It was amazing to be, because he built this from castle. castle. He built he it built by, it by hand, hand back in back the 30s, 30s, I guess it is. It's, it's, it's where, where he began, began studying, studying at some point. Um, um, he, he began, began to be very, very interested in, in studying the philosophies, philosophies of China and Egypt, Egypt particularly in Greece, and looking at the precedents for contemporary psychology within these cultures. In the old days, before the... the the beginnings of modern science in the 1700s and 1800s, people, people studied chemistry, but they really didn't have any concept of chemistry, and it's preferred now as alchemy. Alchemy is kind of proto-chemistry, and it was the idea that you could take base substances like lead and turn them into precious metals like gold. And, gold. and it was before there was any awareness of, of you know, gold, gold is a, uh, an element, element that can't really make something that they could turn into it stands on its own. So what Jung did is he began to study the traditions. There was incredible commonalities across the various worlds. 
um, traditions of alchemy and, and symbols uh, generally, uh, generally, and found and huge found similarities in looking at, looking at uh, processes, uh, processes that begin to think if they're literally, if they're literally wrong, wrong, which they are scientifically, they are scientifically wrong, wrong, mistaken, and mistaken. And what's, and up, what's with up with that? that people that in China, in China were, positing were positing the same ideas, same ideas in the same, in the same era, era as people as in people Egypt, Egypt people or people in, well, across, across the world. world. And so you begin to look at alchemy symbolically or psychologically, and then use alchemy as a metaphor for psychological transformation. So all of that to say, I want to I want to try his writings of alchemy, writings of into, alchemy talking about, into talking about um, um, creativity. Creativity. So, so the, the basic so idea being is that if you take a base take a base turn it into gold, well, how does that, how does that, how does that analogy to what we try to accomplish, accomplish in psychotherapy? psychotherapy. You'll see, you see in the notes here, here that what's required in psychotherapy as an alchemy transformation, I believe in Jung felt this very strongly, that in psychotherapy there are two transformations that occur that need to be present to coexist. And first of all, it would be the transformation of the psychotherapist herself. Himself, is that the psychotherapist must be transformed to begin with. And then secondly, of one's client. And so this is what somebody said about how you can't fake it. You have to be a psychotherapist. There's a story that you wrote, a Chinese story that you wrote in his volume. It's the story of the rainmaker. And everybody may be familiar with it, I'll just repeat it because it's a great story. There was a province in China that uh, had experienced drought, drought for, for year, year after year after year. year. It was, it was, everything, everything had died. died. And they had, and they had tried, tried everything. everything. Magic, Magic incantations, burning special, special incenses, all kinds of rituals, rituals to, try to try to get, get the gods, gods to send rain to this parched to this province, province to no avail. To no and avail. So that they heard that there was a wizened old man way off in the distance. Uh, we'll say in Mongolia. Uh, we'll in Mongolia who, who, who they seemed to have miraculous powers. So they invited him across miles to come to the village. He came to the village and promptly retired to a little hut and disappeared for three days. Days. At the end of, which, the end of which, the sky began to fill with clouds, began, began, began to rain, and he did something he had never done, it began to snow, it went on and on and on. And, on. and, on. and so, of course, and the man comes out of the, the, the hut, the, 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 this little man, and they say, what's up? What's up? What happened? What happened? And he said, well, you know, when I came to the village, I felt that it was out of balance. And then I noticed that it was out of balance. So I realized that in order to address the village out of balance, I needed to find my own balance. And so that's what I did, and then the rest happened. Happened. That's the that's, that's, that's story. That's, that's the myth. The myth. <clears throat> Most of Most the focus, of the focus for, the for the next few minutes will be on looking, looking at what happens, what happens to us, I'm going to use the term intrapersonally, what has to happen to the therapist intrapersonally to be therapeutic and how this ties into training to be a psychotherapist. I do want to a little bit later begin talking about the interpersonal dimension of what happens in the therapy session or the therapy situation, both of which I want to use the psychology of creative process as the entry point. <clears throat> There's a psychiatrist at, at um, Harvard, Albert, Albert Rothenberg, who's one of the two or three experts in the country on creative process. He's written a lot about it and some of his research, and I love the way that he talks about creative process. Creative process. He, is, he, is, he himself, himself is also a psychoanalyst, so he's writing as a, as a researcher, as a psychiatrist, as a therapist. As a therapist. And he, and he prefers, prefers to, to uh, create a process. process. The term that he gives for that, for that is, is, you'll see this in the notes, he calls it almost spatial process. I used, I used to do this experiment, experiment. I was teaching at another, another university. university. I don't know if you, I don't ever, know if you ever participated in this. I would come, I would come in the beginning of class and I would take a Coke can. can. It, would be it would be memorable. And I would sit in the, the middle of the class and we would sit the class in a circle. And, and I would say, okay, what I want us to do is to stare at the Coke can for an uncomfortably long period of time. Generally, you know, once you get out there about five or ten minutes, it starts kind of weird. And so we would sit there for 15 or 20 minutes. With with, with no with instructions no other than that. Other than and then that. what we do is we come do, back, come back to, to um, um, the experience the people have. People have. And I, and I, I can remember a range of experiences. <laughs> People, people, you know, you, you know, can look at the Coke can, can in the category, category of the Coke can, can, but you can get our get various ways of organizing, organizing experience and perceptions on, on. And it was and amazing. It was amazing. I, can I can remember some of the examples that people, people were talking about, about some of these versions of my own. You begin, you begin to look, to look, at, look at, a at a Coke can and look at the letters and they spell C-O-K-E. And at some point, if you stare at long enough, the letters begin to become shapes and figures. And they're not they're not necessarily literal anymore. They're like images. And, 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 and then, then you get the, the, the color of the red can against the green carpet. And I, I remember a couple of students beginning to kind of feel like they were losing their marbles. Actually, it was kind of touching. 
<laughs> the coat changes. That, that kind of, kind of spiritual, spiritual dipping in thought. <coughs> that's, that's, that's what Albert Rothenberg means by homo spatial process. process. Is that when, when you bring two things, things into the same space, space. space. In, this in this case, a coat can, can, can in my eyes, eyes your, your eyes, see that. That the combination of those two things that were never in space, people will sit around the coat can for 20 minutes. You sit and do that for a period of time. Something new comes with that. Homo spatial into one, homo, spatial, one space, that merger creates something that's not reducible to the Coke can or Bob Weathers or Susan Rowles. It, it's, it's something unique to the, the, uh, the synergy, the interaction. Whether you're thinking of like creative art, think of any art that's ever made into you, music, art, dance, it's somebody who thought of doing something that no one ever done before. I went to a tribute concert on Sunday night at the Greek theater, a tribute to Jimi Hendrix. <coughs> and uh, they had his original band there, they're still alive. It was amazing to me. And all kinds of people were giving tribute to him. There were even people that influenced Jimi Hendrix that were there. That's all they were. were. They were like, his influences, influences were there. It was amazing. It was amazing. Um, um, but I kept thinking I kept of this, that Jimi Hendrix came, came out in the mid-60s. He was playing he was with the soul band, the Eisner Brothers. They couldn't quite, they couldn't hold, quite them hold them back. He went on he tour went on in America, America with, with the monkeys. The monkeys. Hey, hey, we're the monkeys. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? That. That. He just had a whole different thing going on with guitar. That's an example, That's an example of, bringing of bringing some, some bringing bringing a Fender, a Fender Stratocaster guitar. Jimmy Hendrix is just, just, just raw genius, genius, and out and comes something, something that people. people well, how many, how many years, years later? Is it? No. Thirty-eight, 38 years, died, died, thirty-eight years, years ago. ago. Thirty-eight, 38 years, years later, later, there had been tributes, tributes, and there's, and there's people across all generations. It was amazing. It was amazing. So, in an art, in an art, artistic context, also I think of scientific creativity. Certainly, Thomas Edison is an example, or Einstein. Um, you can think of examples down through the history of science and uh, manufacturing and so on, where you put things together that no one ever thought of putting together. It's like, that's the mark of genius. That's, that's the mark of, of uh, creativity. Uh, I have a, 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 a little piece here about, about the, the German, German philosopher here, here Hegel, Hegel who, um, some, some of you have probably read about you've ever read uh, in, uh, in philosophy, philosophy like the philosophy of Marxism. Marxism. Uh, Karl, uh, Karl Marx, Marx and Engels, Engels relied, relied on Hegel, Hegel to develop what's called dialectical, dialectical materialism. His dialectic is pretty, pretty familiar stuff, too. Is it when you, is bring, it when you bring a thesis and an antithesis in the same space, what comes of it is, again, like with homo spatial process, a third is not reducible to the two constituents. There's something more that's been created. That's a good image of it. So, so I want to talk about how this goes for us inside, inside um, um, particularly in the context of training to be psychotherapists, and then I want to bring, bring this into, into, into what clients, what clients want and what goes, and what goes on, on there. Uh, there. How do it? Do it? How, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and proceed. If you all have, have questions, questions or comments, you can stop, stop me. me. Um, you you had this idea, you felt like it was really important to uh, aid our clients in doing what he called holding the tension of the opposites. I think of a central metaphor within the Western uh, tradition would be the image of the, cro the cross, Christianity. Uh, I was just at uh, Notre Dame with uh, Dr. Ryan Grimes, and, Grimes and we went into the, the um, the so like there, and I was so moved, I was so moved, moved by all, all of the imagery, imagery down to the history of Christianity, but the, the image is utterly beautiful, the images of the cross, inside, the cross, inside and outside, like in the glass, in, the glass, in, in uh, beautiful, beautiful gold, gold, it was incredible. incredible. That, uh, that, uh, looking, looking at that image symbolically, without getting, without getting actually, into actually into the specifics of, of the religious the religion tradition of Christianity, what an what image of holding the opposites that is. If you think about it, you have up and down, you have east to west, right to left, and, 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 and so very much the idea, idea of connecting earth, earth, earth to heaven, heaven or, or uh, ourselves to that which is beyond, and, and also left, left to right, right I'll talk more about this in a minute uh, 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 from the Jungian perspective, perspective, but that, that, that uh, uh, seeing symbolically, symbolically the Christ the archetypal, archetypal, archetypal figure, figure of, of, of holding, holding the opposite, the opposite and, that, and that, that, that within within this way of viewing it, that that's that that's the temple for all of us, but that's really what it's like therapy should be about, would be, would be, would be, would be to, to aid for us to integrate that, that which, which is less obvious, obvious to us. Well, so for example, for the game of cross, cross, if what, what I'm most connected, connected to is this, this, this uh, axis, let's say down here, here, then I need to develop this. 
if, if I'm connected, connected to this end of this axis, axis then you need to develop this. There's the different, different terms, terms that you use for that. that. One, One of my favorite, favorite terms comes out of the poet Robert Bly. He calls it, Robert Bly. He calls it one's shadow, one's shadow, which is to integrate which that, is integrate which, is that which is other than what we're identified with. Jung what we're identified with our persona. Our persona. And so all that we're not identified with sometimes it's even out of conscious awareness represents the shadow. And Bly said it's important for us to integrate, assimilate, Masticate, masticate, <laughs> digest, digest, metabolize, metabolize our, our shadow. Our shadow. <clears throat> I'll give you an example, give you an example of, that. of that. Uh, 25, uh, 25 years ago, years ago at UNC, uh, doing, uh, doing my last year of internship, and I had the best supervisor I ever had there. there. Her name was Nancy. Nancy. And there was and there forget forget coming, coming into, into to, uh, 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 this is a few years ago, this is six years of graduate school, whatever, coming in. Bring in my little, little tape, tape of my, of my little session, session with my client, my client. and Nancy goes, she's putting, putting it on like this. this. She, she let, let it go, go for about 30, 30 seconds, seconds and she stopped, stopped it. it. And she, she says, what, what, what was happening, happening right there, Bob? And I went, what do you what mean? mean? She said, what was going on? I said, well, I was just trying to kind of, I'm just, I was trying to empathize with the client. I was just kind of like feeling like I was with the client. And she went, wrong answer. She said, no, she said, so that's half of a right answer. She said, that's good, because you are present in a feeling kind of way. I want you to be able to explain to me why you were doing what you were doing. I want you to be able to articulate that theoretically and technically. And we, you've got to be kidding me. So we spent the entire year in the Nancy supervision helping to develop the capacity to oscillate between feeling presence and some kind of cognitive awareness in terms of navigating what's going on. It's absolutely important, she said, to be present as you are, Bob. That's your strong, strong suit. suit. But, but what I want you to do is develop the ability, ability as well, well to be able to articulate, articulate what you're doing. There's a hand raised. Yes, yeah, yeah, Denise Hall would like to comment and say that making friends with your shadow is essential for psychotherapists. Otherwise, how can you honor your client's shadow? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so, right so right on. We're going to talk about talk empathy in a few minutes. minutes. Uh, no, I, I, we're going to talk about the way you talked about non-possessive form and empathic attunement. What's her name Denise. That's right on, Denise. That is right on. In fact, I, I believe that that's like a formula. formula. If, one if one hasn't, hasn't done, done that, that, then one's one capacity to be empathically attuned is absolutely directly correlated to that. Like, you've, you've got, got to, to do, do the one to do the other. We'll talk more about that. Brilliant. That's great. That's great. So, so we'll back up for just a second. I'll get to that in just a minute. So Nancy spent this year for me helping me to, de to develop an awareness of what you would call my inferior function. I am able to think. <laughs> It's, it's just, just that, that I leave with feeling. It's like, like uh, I, I'm, I'm a, a lifelong driver. I've been doing 45 years. years. I'm right-handed. Right <clears throat> and, and, um, and yet and I, I can leave with my left hand. hand. That, that means drumming. drumming. It's like, it's like, like you're sitting on a drum set. If you leave, you're usually playing your right rhythm with your left right hand. And most people are right-handed. That's what I'm saying. About half a dozen years ago, I decided I wanted to develop the left hand with some... Serious seriousness. So I just so stopped just playing right-handed. Right -handed. So for the last so for the half dozen years, I've been playing left-handed. Left I'll never I'll be never as good, as good left -handed left -handed as I am right-handed. Right right I am dominantly right-handed. But it's about, but it's about developing one's relationship, relationship to that which is less familiar, familiar. What, you what you call the inferior function. function. My dominant, My dominant function, function as a therapist, therapist is, is feeling. feeling. Nancy was in the provision saying, okay, let's help her great thinking. I sometimes tease with students. I said, this is why I read neuroscience. <laughs> but I really love to read poetry, poetry and interviews with creative, creative artists. artists. I also, of course, myself to read their own Yes, yes. Kathleen Thompson said that one of my favorite words that paradox. Two things that are contradictory, but both true. I want to understand more of the role of paradox in psychological change, which you are addressing, yes. Paradox is in future and western truth. Can you say more of the psychological insight? That's wonderful, Kathleen. Kathleen? Hi, Kathleen. That's wonderful. Two things come to mind. Years ago, I woke up from a dream. I wake up from a dream. Um, um, before I was going to teach, I wake up from a dream, dream and I won't have, have an image, image. I'll, I'll actually have a saying. <laughs> 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 it, it must happen that, that, that guy barked with a rose quotation. quotation. I'll, I'll wake, wake up with a saying, and I came into teaching, teach, and, and I just wrote it out on the board, so I still remember it. It came to me that morning. This is what came to me that morning. It came to me out of the dream. Paradox is what God was like to the human mind. Paradox is what God was like to the human mind. Uh, also, uh, also comes, comes by John, John Lennon. John Lennon said, um, um, 
Everything, Everything is, true. is true. And so and is so the opposite. Is opposite. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, it's bit, a little of bit of what we're talking about. about. And I want to give, give me just a second, second with that, Kathy, and I'll get more into that. How it, how it is to hold not just two opposites, because we're not just two. We've got all of these different parts of ourselves. And they only seem paradoxical from within our experience. God only seems paradoxical from within the limitations of the dualistic mind. It goes this versus that. When you have an experience that you design to the divine and tradition, there's no paradox in that. It's only, it's only later when you try to, have you ever have you tried to explain, explain the experience, experience of the sun setting over whatever, whatever lake, lake or ocean you live near? near. It's, it's like, like the experience is a paradoxical. The experience is absolutely riveting and transformative. And then when I try to explain to somebody, I just prefer not to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Kathleen says that she thinks God exists in paradox. There's, There's a, a Catholic, Catholic monk, Thomas, Thomas Merton, a friend of mine, mine uh, 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 knew Thomas Merton. He, he uh, was... was at the, at the Abbey of Thomas Merton. Merton. And he said, Merton, Merton used, used this phrase in his spiritual direction, direction with my friend. He said, he said, he said, he said it's, it's important to live in the belly of paradox. It wasn't one's a relationship, a proper relationship to the divine. I love that image of the belly of paradox. I always think of um, Jonah, you know, getting in there. Yeah. I, that wouldn't be far off from talking about being an effective psychotherapist <laughs> to be able to live in the belly of paradox. Um, all that we're talking about is is um, it's, it's not, not so much about, about theory. theory. It's, 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 it's about somehow locating, somehow locating oneself, oneself in such a way that, that when you sit with a client, client. Let, me let me just keep going. going. Okay. Okay. This, 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 this is, is good, good stuff. stuff. Mm. Mm. I've already talked, I've already about, talked about drumming. About drumming. Talk, what, what about, about it though? Right 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 I do want to talk, talk about paradox. And this is Kathleen. I think this is Kathleen. Who has thought of as an example of so, so I talk about, about Nancy's supervision, supervision I mean, thinking, of, thinking and feeling. Um, you all are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. It's, in fact, most people are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. Like just, it's kind it's of part, part of our culture, culture at this point. point. We, we have, have these different needs that are in the, in the form, form of pyramids. pyramids. And it starts with physiological needs at the basis. And then once those, those needs are handled, then we move to safety and security needs. For example, the way I think of it, it doesn't really matter if I have a house if I can't breathe. <laughs> But if you can breathe, then a health becomes, health becomes matter. a matter. And then, and the, then next the next phase is called belonging, belonging needs, 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 and after that, that self-esteem, self-esteem needs, needs, and, and then self-actualization needs. needs. And then, and then the last year was like you begin to write about self-transcendence needs. So we have this hierarchy that is situated in such a way that whatever, whatever comes, comes next is, uh, uh, it, it, it requires a foundation in the next prior levels. And so those are all motivators. Uh, but the lower, but ones, the lower have ones have priority. The lower ones have priority. <laughs> this would be a this way, be a of, way of, thinking of thinking homo spatially. When you're sitting, when you're sitting with, with a client, client, I just did this, this last week in the class, the class I was teaching. teaching. We, viewed we viewed a video, video of, a of a client who was, was presented with alcoholism. alcoholism. And there was, there was a cultural, cultural layer of variables that, that were involved in this. And so I, I had the students in the class view the video. It was a diagnostic kind of video. And then um, I didn't go through this particular grid, but it, I'll, I'll you, you like it. It's, 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 it's a kind of is I wanted to, under, to I wanted to be thinking of this client in, in multiple ways, ways that are all operating, operating at the same, same time. time. It, it, uh, in fact, the image, image that I shared with you was when I was in graduate school, 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 school in Pasadena. Pasadena. There, was there was a bookstore book there in downtown Romans, and I would go by the bookstore from time to time, and they had this thing in there. It was it was a multiple level chest game. I think there were three levels of a chest game. Transparent. Just, and I, I never really figured out how to play. I, I would just, just kind of ponder it. <laughs> I, I, I think, think about, about multiple levels of understanding phenomena. Like, like how, how can somebody play one game of chess? Let's play two. Let's play three. three. It's, it's like, like a three-dimensional chess. chess. So the way, the, one of the ways that I think about thinking homospatially, putting a lot of pieces into in one place at once. What would it be like to understand this client, the one in the video with substance abuse? What's, What's going, going on physiologically for this is a man, man for him? him. So, so you understand from a from medical, medical perspective, from a health psychological, psychological perspective, what's, what's going, going on. on. My own background, background is I come, come from a family. family. I'm the only, only person in my family that's not medical. medical. Everybody in my family is medical. I've talked, talked about this with my colleagues, colleagues here. here. And, and I grew up in a family where everything that happened was seen medically. Everything they really got this level right. Everything was reduced to physiology. 
uh, uh, there are other levels. levels. If I think if of I think the, the, the safety, safety and security, and security level, level, the analogy to that, that psychology, psychology is where you need to train people, train people and skills, skills, basic skills, skills, and not and assume that people don't have basic, have basic skills and functioning, functioning socially, socially, functioning, functioning, functioning uh, emotionally, 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 and so on. And I think, and I think of, of uh, a cognitive, cognitive behavioral, behavioral process of psychology really, really honoring this level. level. And you can see why. Uh, that, that whole idiom or that whole domain, domain of psychology is so incredibly important and probably prior to more uh, mm, more interior oriented psychologies. So if we keep going on going that hierarchy, there's physiological, physiological psychology, 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 safety and security, and security needs, skills skill development, development a la cognitive, cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy. therapy. The next, the next level, level that I think about would have to do with the long and the according to Maslow. I think about, I think about this, any, any psychotherapy is interpersonally oriented. oriented. For this For example, example, I use family, family systems therapy, therapy as being very important in terms of teaching and modeling and fostering interpersonal communication. Although now Maslow, that would be preparatory to the next level, which would begin to go into what he calls self-esteem needs. I thought of the way that self. I just talked to a client last night in a group about uh, his wife was in town. We were having a group and we were talking about his issues, uh, which are around substance abuse, having their foundation in what he thought of as guilt, shame, and other what I would call intra-psychic conflicts. To get into that requires a different, a different technology or a different level of analysis or a different, different chess board. board. And I think and the I think psychodynamic, psychodynamic approaches of therapy being, being one idea that really, really focuses on that, that interior uh, uh, domain. domain. Uh, uh, next, next, you go on to self-actualization. This really is the place in which Maslow, Viktor Frankl, uh, Yala, all of the existential tradition has addressed uh, these, these needs of of self-actualization around value and meaning and purpose. That's, That's what, what that, that domain addresses. And, and then finally, self-transcendence, I think of this in terms of the world religious traditions. I see, I see very few clients, in fact, you can help this way, way, is that in the in first, first half of life, life every, every client is dealing, dealing with just coping, coping healing, healing, developing skills, skills. Uh, so, so leave it to the right, so love and to work. But then after the second half of life, then he saw every client coming in as primarily spiritual or religious concerns. And by that, by, in that, he wanted to help them find some root within some tradition or combination of traditions that was their own that could help them move into the second half of life. So, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, Grant Gorman, who is one of our women who has made me a comment there that he wanted to get our fellow students to know about that positive psychology was a great group for the computer here, Dr. Hoffman. That's great, that's great, that's great. Say more about positive psychology. Oh, okay. Is that what positive psychology focuses on? I should know more about it. It's great. There's so much that I don't know. Okay. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a group from 1998. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Learned optimism. optimism. That's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, I had a professor in graduate school, school grant who, who um, we had a whole course on the MPI. So he said, the, how did you interpret it? And, 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 and I remember the last question that it really meant a lot to me is that we went through these 10 clinical scales and arch took us through each one of them and looked at what's the flip side of it being pathological. So he looked at anxiety, depression, even schizophrenia, the schizophrenia scale, and looked at what is those bowed and what if you don't have any of that going on? What is it to be What's completely, completely absent, absent of, of uh, worry about your physical, physical well-being? Well -being. What is it to be what completely, completely absent, absent of introversion? Of introversion. Like things like this, they can be pathologized. It's really a noble really thing in the eyes, looking at it from, 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 from a positive from perspective. A perspective. I'll mention this, I'll mention this as a slide as relevant to the grant. grant. Um, um, Hillman, Hillman at another at conference, another conference he says there's two ways to remember our life. One of, One of them is to remember, remember our life traumatically. And so you, you go, go back, back and, and psychology does, does this all the time. time. We we encourage clients to come in. I've had clients come in and, come in and say, I don't have anything to talk about this week, Dr. Bob. It's been a great week. <laughs> I just go, how do we how do we get so misguided in this field where clients don't have anything to talk about because they went well this week? Oh, it's so sad to me. Hillman said you can remember life traumatically. And, and that, that is a lot of our focus. focus. And that's necessity. It says it's, it's also important for your life. You can remember your life just from what's initially is to remember, to remember these events, events in our life. life. Remember, remember our, these, these what feel like traumas in the moment of initiations into greater awareness, greater consciousness, expanding and maintaining. I love that way of thinking about it. So anything. Oh, there's a great poem. Great poem. Read it just a second. What hurts, who blesses you? 
Darkness, Darkness is your candle. Is your, candle. Your, boundaries your boundaries are your quest. You've got to be really careful, you careful with that. Because with you, that. Don't wanna, you don't want to... Somebody who's going to go, oh, this is really your initiation. Really, this is the really, great, this great thing, thing, thing that happens. The, the, the epitome of epitome non-empathy. Of but I, the way I think about it therapy is it's helping clients get around the corner. We come in and we're... Hurt, hurt, we're ticked off, we're, ticked off, we're, um, we're um, vigilant about others' vigilant about insults, and insults and injuries. At some point, we turn the corner where we, corner where we begin, to begin to incorporate and assimilate and realize that this is my life. How do I weave in this has been my faith into, into really my initiation my in terms of my destiny? Yes. And when it turns the corner, corner. That, that, that's not sad. <laughs> That's the, that's, the <laughs> <laughs> that's the goal of psychotherapy, really, to really get to get to, get to, that. Get to that. There was a, there was a, uh, there was a German, German analyst, Melanie, Melanie Klein, Klein, who said there's, who two, said there's fundamental two fundamental positions in psychology, uh, 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 human, uh, psychology, human psychology, psychology, the first, the first one she called the paranoid, the paranoid pizoid pizoid position, position, which is a fancy word, but what she meant by that was it, it, we're 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 parent, parent, and we all go through this. In fact, probably most people live in this place, sadly. Paranoid you're means you're looking outside, outside. You're looking, up, you're looking, looking outside, 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 outside for, for what's going to make me happy, happy and what makes me unhappy. What makes me unhappy. If it wasn't so for, for you, I'd be perfectly happy. 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 That kind of attitude. Kind of attitude. Um, um, and skin is because, because, because it's attached. It's not, it's not, it's not attached to others, and it's not the least attached to ourselves. So we walk around projecting on other people, being not attached to them and ourselves. And she said there's a second position in the goal of all psychotherapy is to go around the corner. She said the second position is what she called the depressive position. And what that is, is it's really drinking one's bitter cup of wrath, was her term. It's, it's taking in one's life and really grieving. That's exactly what Ryan's doing. It's, it's, it's grieving, and then once one moves to that, that then, then there's, there's the possibility of assimilating kind of into one's, one's molecular structure all that otherwise have projected out. out. That's, that's a really good metaphor. metaphor. And, and I really do think of it as psychotherapeutically. If I can help a client get around that corner, we've done our work. The strange, the strange part about, part about it is that things get worse before they get better. Get better. Clients will clients come in and know we, we the egg. egg. I just had to have a client find out the last one. Why would I want to go back to the It hurts so bad. And it can. It can. It can. But the goal, goal is not, not, not hurt. hurt. The, goal. the goal is to move beyond that. I'll just do it. I'll just do it. I'll just do it. Um, Grant, like to share with you, um, both as well. Please, please, please do. Um, mm, that's, that's wonderful. wonderful. The cup that holds your joy is most likely carved from your sadness. Mm, that's really great. That's great. I'm going to go ahead and type that quote into Thank the you, um, cool. instant messages and chat sessions so that everyone can see it. That's, that's great. great. Okay. If, if you remind, remind me, I'll send these poems to people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, just I just need to remind you about what you were. No, no, no. If we, if we keep going along in our, in our no, notes, is that, is that kind of clear, clear what we're talking about? Multiple levels, multiple levels of, caring. of caring. The thing about the this, thing about this is, it's is not a cognitive task. task. I, 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 I think I you think can read a can zillion, zillion textbooks text book and not be able to hold five or six different perspectives in place. It's really, really. Let, let me come, come back. back. I want to come, come back to that. Let me just look at that for just a second. second. Yeah, yeah, let me come, come back to that. that. Let, let me talk a little bit about procrastes. <clears throat> uh, some of you may know this story. There was, there was a, um, uh, uh, there was a gentleman on the road in ancient Greece between Athens and Delphi. His name was Procrustes. I don't know why his mother named him that name, but nevertheless. At any rate, there's a story about Procrustes. Is that wayfarers, uh, people traveling, it was too long of a journey for one day. day. And they, and they needed to split, to split it up. up. Well, well, just decided, here's, here's a way to make a buck. buck. So he so created, created a little, little stone, stone hut on the way, way, on, on the way, way there. there. And he would and invite, invite people, people in. in. And they, they had a bed, bed for them. them. So they come, so on, come in. on in. Have a little rest. rest. The only, the only one problem, problem is the bed was harder than it was. Is that he had issues. Issues. And so if somebody laid down on the bed and they were too short for his bed, it was very important that they fit his bed. It was like like mechanism. And he would stretch it to fit his bed. The only problem is that if you were on the tall side, the tall side and you, and you, were, you hung, were, over, the you hung bed, over the bed, he lopped off, he your, lopped limbs. off your limbs. This is PG rated. PG rated. He would lop off, he your would lop off your limbs. That's been referred, That's been referred to ever since as the procrustean bed. bed. Now you, now you see, it see it everywhere. 
How does that apply, does to, that what apply to what we're about? talking about? What's that What's saying that about, thing a about a hammer and a nail? nail? If you're a hammer, you're a hammer everything looks like a nail. Like a nail, nail <laughs> you just you go around town like that. Like that. Is, that is that in, in psychotherapy, psychotherapy um, um, if, if I am, I am primarily, primarily feeling, feeling which I am, I am it's, so it's so easy for me to impose, to impose that, that grid, that on, grid client. on a client. If, if in psychotherapy, if, if, if I'm, I'm a psychoanalyst, it's so easy for me to impose what seems like native to me. But what if what the client needs is cognitive behavioral therapy? Or what if what the client needs is a thinking response in this moment? Some way to form the way to narrate a narrative that feeling that alone, feeling will alone will it's really, it's really, really important, really important that we not do to our clients what the did to the, the travelers the travel from after the Delphi. And I think, I think, I mean, if there's a strong correlation that comes out of social, comes out of social psychology, psychology, it would be, it would be a direct, a direct correlation, correlation between ambiguity, ambiguity and, anxiety. and anxiety. And this is where it gets this is where really, really tricky for us, for us psychotherapy as psychotherapy training. training. Because, because, because what we're talking about is we're doing a minute ago, I need to form this better. You can't. It's, 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 like it's like personal. <laughs> there's, a there's a great philosopher, Michael, Michael Bologna, Bologna, who's written a, 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 a book and he's written, written his entire, entire career uh, called, called, called personal, personal Knowledge, knowledge is, that is that you can read the textbook, the textbook, the textbook, the textbook, and still do what the did. You've got to got somehow cultivate in the smithy of your soul a tolerance for ambiguity. The problem is we're all humans, and ambiguity leads us to feel anxious. Now imagine getting to a power difference like psychotherapy, where I'm coming in as the expert, one author, a Swiss, uh, analyst, analyst that I met, I met over years, years ago. ago. He, he calls, calls it the human patient, patient archetype. archetype. Um, Otto, Otto Guggenbill Craig, Craig is his name. He's written a book called Power in Helping Professions. He calls it the patient, patient, the healer, patient archetype. He basically says, anywhere a healer is, guess what? There's got to be a patient. So you walk in the room, it, so it's an asymmetrical relationship by definition. And then think about it, if I'm imposing a more limited grid, let's say a non-paradoxical grid, or a unilinear grid, rather than a more complicated, multi-directional, multi-level uh, awareness and presence, and open to being fallible, imagine what can happen to clients. My own view is this is why clients come in. Is this, is this, this is why we get messed up? up. <laughs> Is that we've been responded to environmentally in a suboptimal way, way by, by people, people doing, doing the Christian dead on us. Well, well meaning, but that's, that's what's happened. happened. So, so why is psychotherapy that perpetuates that be therapeutic? Perpetuates that be therapeutic. And so in order to develop those muscles, and so in order to develop those muscles, that kind of the carrier that can tolerate ambiguity, I think you've got to find something other than just reading more books. I way bigger than reading books. I don't think that reading books will get you there. Grant, Grant, the no formula is the best formula. <clears throat> Can I share another poem? Can I share another poem? It's great. It's great. <laughs> Neither Christian, Neither Christian nor, Jewish nor, nor Muslim. Jewish nor Muslim. I belong to the I belong beloved. To the beloved. I have seen the two worlds as one, and that one called one two. Call two. First, first, last, last outer, outer inner, inner, only that, only breath, that breath breathing, breathing human, human being. I just love I that. Love that. Only, that only that breath breathing, breathing human being. being. It's a way, it's to, a way to radically honor any spiritual tradition out of which you come, come. come. But, but, but there's, there's no formula. formula. There's, there's a great, a great album, album by the, 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 the uh, uh, Irish singer, singer Dan Morrison. Morrison. No, no guru, guru, no method, no master. There's no formula. When I was a uh, freshman in high school, 1969, Samuel Beckett won the Nobel Prize for Literature that year. And uh, I read about him, and then later I read, and then I went to see the play. What's the name of the play? Waiting for Godot. You get these two guys sitting, and they're waiting for the formula. They're waiting for Godot. And ain't no method, ain't no master, ain't no guru. <laughs> This is though, isn't it? It's a very really disturbing place for me to visit young man. Because I wanted there to be, though, I wanted there to be, wanted there to be, be a, 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 a method, method formula. If we want to push, push that up just a little bit more, I thought that was your Push up a little bit more. more. There's, There's not only no formula, but no formula. What do you say? The best formula is no formula? No formula is the best formula. Including the theory that there's no formula that's the best formula. <laughs> Isn't that weird? It's like in, you just you're constantly having to hold lightly. I, I, I think this pertains absolutely what happens in the psychotherapy office. office. I just, I just I, 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 yeah. 
And I think, think getting, getting there is relatively personal. personal. We're going to continue talking about that. I see that, Seth. I'll go through one of each one individually. Amy Hall. 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 To me, the therapist's job is to support clients through the ambiguity of the liminal phase from the familiar to the unfamiliar. That's perfect. And imagine what happens to me if I, in so far as I'm uncomfortable with my own ambiguities, how the heck can I host you through the, through the threshold of the doorway? Absolutely requires that. that. And it's and completely transferable what we're talking, talking about. about. Any, 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 any orientation, orientation psychotherapy, every orientation requires that. That, that. that lies that behind all of them. them. I've thought, I've thought about this recently, recently. Um, um, teaching a course, course on, on uh, uh, theories of counseling. counseling. How, How does every one of these therapists that we're studying himself or herself was, 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 was radically willing, willing to let go, go of the familiar? You know, you know Jung didn't study under Jung. Jung. <laughs> so you used to think that I'm Jung, not a Jungian. The courage that it the courage that it the courage that it takes the courage that it takes. Uh, uh, my point uh, being uh, is that uh, my point being is that you, know, you have all these various you know, pioneers, various let's say, in psychotherapy. In psychotherapy. We study them and then we become true them, believers. Become true not, believers. Not, necessarily, not, it's not necessarily, but it's possible to become true believers. How ridiculous is How that? Ridiculous is that? <laughs> it's in philosophy, it's they call it a performance, call it a performance of contradiction. contradiction. With the thing that you're with performing, you're performing contradicts itself by virtue of, by virtue of, of, of the performance. It's, 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 uh, uh, these people, these people we, we, we study them because they were originals. Here we get back to cultivating one's art form. I love, you all know the cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead. And, and uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, social, uh, social linguist, linguist communication, communication there is Gregory Bateson. Gregory Bateson, Gregory Bateson, Gregory Bateson, Bateson the guy that uh, 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 double bind up at uh, uh, Palo, Alto. Palo Alto. Well, Gregory, well, Gregory Bateson, Bateson, Bateson was married to Margaret Mead, Mead. Mead. And their daughter and their is Mary Catherine Bateson. Bateson. And I got to, and hear, I got her to hear her a couple years ago. It was brilliant. brilliant, And she was up there and she was speaking. She wrote them. She was speaking about this. And she picked four exemplary women's lives. The title of her book is Opposing a Life. And looking at and one's looking life at one's as a creative, as a creative contribution, contribution, creative composition, creative composition. These people that, These we, people study that we study as psychotherapy uh, theorists, as pioneers, theorists, as pioneers, they were that. They were that. Can we afford, Can we afford to be afford any, to be less? any no, less? It's not it's about not us about being of that, that ilk, ilk, but it is about it is being about within the same, same process, isn't it? It's about, it's about to be, being, being open, open to letting, letting go, go, go of the familiar, being open to creativity, looking at a coke can originally. That's what they did. Why would it be any different for us? Honestly, Honestly, if the theories, theories are really effective, they should be dying and living themselves, themselves daily. daily. Like uh, uh, yes, yes, Susie. Um, Anne Lee. Hi, Anne. Hi. Anne. Hi. So happy to meet you. Happy to meet you. you. <laughs> I've, been I've been writing to Anne. Do you think that the therapist should be intuitive and flexible to meet the needs of the client at that moment? Hmm. Mm-hmm. I remember I years, years ago, ago and, and I was, was in correspondence with some researchers, researchers in Stockholm, in Stockholm um, um, who were studying creative, 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 creative process, process. And, and they had, they a, had definition a definition for creativity. For creativity. They were doing, they were doing laboratory, laboratory research in a white, in a white lab, lab on, on, on uh, uh, creativity. What was their definition? Creativity equals... Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It, it equals... equals Attentiveness, attentiveness, you, you have, have to be present to be free, to, to be attentive, attentive and aware. aware. But, but it's that, that coupled with flexibility. I love that definition. That nice. Being really attentive but not wedded to what one's attending to. Being flexible but not being spaced out. It's like uh, Bob Dylan calls it going east on a westbound train. <laughs> <laughs> holding both of those. Talk about a paradox. Talk about holding the tension of opposites. To be fully attentive with the client and open-handed in that. To, to be in diffuse awareness, but just completely just, completely pre- just, just that, that combination. combination. So, so intuition, what was the second thing? thing? Um, and the comment, again, it was uh, inflexible. Intuitive, Intuitive and flexible. Like, like, thank you, that's wonderful. wonderful. So, uh, Melissa, 
would like to uh, make the point that she liked that you talked about being encouraged for the therapeutic process and that it is so important for the therapist and the client to be courageous. And that was Melissa. And then Jim followed that up saying, I believe it was Drakers who said we need to have the courage to be imperfect. So often when we study the, sorry, spelling, study the originators of these new, of these dynamic new ways to facilitate the change process, we quote unquote want to be just like them. That is not having the courage to find our own path to originality. Yeah, yeah. Thank you guys so much. That is really at the heart of all of this. That's what this presentation is about. It, it means no disrespect at all to all the theorists. In fact, it's a deeper respect. It's not respecting just the content of what they say. It's the dynamism out of which they speak and are and write. And it feels much more respectful to me to the spirit of Rogers and Freud and B.F. Skinner and Carl Jung and Alfred Adler and all of them because uh, this is what they were doing. This is what they were doing. Uh, I love that. Um, I want to, um, and I want to come back to something I was saying to you and then we're going to move towards looking at the interpersonal dimension and then wrapping up for now and then there'll be questions maybe. Um, I wonder if you guys can even see this here in this presentation. Because, you know, you study all these years in graduate school and you read all this stuff, you take all these exams, you write dissertations, you do this and you do that. And then I'm sitting with the client and rarely in the foreground is theories of psychology. The weirdest thing, isn't it? It's exactly analogous to what happens to me drumming. From 1964 to about 1968 or 9, all I did was practice 26 rudiments for four or five years. I never, ever sat down behind a drum set. I never played musically with anybody. It was just learning these basic rudiments. I think of graduate school like that. And now when I drum, it's just happening. I drummed last night. I drummed last night. And in fact, I was aware of it last night. There was something I was doing that I, that I could write out what I'm doing, but it's not like I'm thinking of it as I'm doing it. Um, I would write it after the effect. I don't really want to write it. But it's, it's founded in all those early years of study. It's exactly like what it's like to be a psychotherapist. You study and then you study more. And, and then it's all background. background. It's all background. How do you all think about that? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. The art, the art is happening. It's completely founded upon all of the five finger exercises or long tones or whatever one does if one does other art besides music. <laughs> what? It's exactly like psychology. Do you think about this? You're good at assessments. Yeah, I mean, that's my main thing right now. I went to graduate school with Mary, and we went through the same classes. And Mary just dug into assessments, and then we ended up working later together, running through this and so on. Mary was absolutely a creative artist, a genius. Like somebody said, psychometrics as art. She was like this. I bet you are too, Christine. Just like it's unbelievable what she's able to do with any of the standardized tests. I never developed that familiarity nor that kind of creative. It's just that wasn't the entry point for me. It's like, so when you're sitting, in fact, when you're sitting doing an assessment with somebody, somebody, and if I sit and do it with them, I feel like I'm doing it by the numbers. Theory really is foreground for me. It's not an exercise in creative imagination or anything particular for me. It felt very rote. It's a sadness to me. It's just the way that my mind works. And when I sit in the presence of a Mary or a you, it really is watching art. And I know with Mary, and I assume with you, that she's sitting and she has so many linkages going on. And it's, and she's fully, it's like, it is like fluid motion. It's not <laughs> like that is for me. That'd be an example of it, where, where you move beyond relying on it, but you have complete access to all of it. Right. Let's see. Yes, uh, Hi. Susan. Hi, Susan. I have several comments, so we'll go through them as we get there. But you'll like this one. Sue Hunter is also a drummer. <laughs> My condolences to your mother and father. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and sometimes she drums mindlessly. We have to be careful not to do therapy in that way. Uh, there's something I want to say about that before we move on. <laughs> There was an author, Robert Stolaro, who's written a lot about intersubjectivity and relationship uh, in psychotherapy. I love something that he's, that he's written about this. He's, uh, and this is, this is a warning to me, Sue, not you. Um, that once 
once, and I'll talk a little bit about this in just a minute or two, too, about what clients want, what clients need. But once we begin to really understand what clients want and what they need, we will never listen the same. And the truth is, I space out. The truth is, I get tired. The truth is, I get ill. The truth is, I get bored. But it becomes less and less okay for me to let much time go by with that. I do this all the time in therapy, is that when I'm gone for 30 seconds or a minute, I'll stop and I'll say, I missed what you said. I really want to get it. And so there's at least enough awareness that when I'm not aware, I can ask back into it. It's really not okay. And that's a courageous thing for me, too. Does it feel good to go, oh, I'm sorry, I was doing a grocery list. I, I, I don't really say that to clients. But, I mean, to admit that, to admit that I wasn't there, because there's a, there's a, it feels, it, it's, a, it's, it's vulnerable. It's embarrassing to be so fallible. But the alternative is to miss what somebody said and, uh, and, I don't want clients to have that experience. It's the same for me, Sue, as a drummer. I really want people to have an experience when I drum. <laughs> I really want to uh, tear their heads off. I mean, I just really want to bump <laughs> like that. And so when I'm drumming, it really is, it is full on. It's very exhausting for me. But I know that it's possible to be moved aesthetically by an art form. And I don't want people like your son playing hockey. I want to do my very best. And we do have our humanness, but you're absolutely right. It's not okay to drum mindlessly. It's not okay to do therapy mindlessly. And so, as Jung said, it's really important for the therapist to keep clean hands. He was a surgeon. He was a surgeon. And he said, just as with a surgeon, it's important to have clean hands. Um, that's what he meant by that, to really keep stuff as cleared out as possible. And it's not about getting all perfectionistic. It's just about really taking seriously this calling and doing all that we can to hone the instrument. And, yeah, whether I'm drumming or Therapy. Yeah. Yeah. I think, but it's also the challenge to be in the moment with the client because, I mean, we are humans too. Yeah. And we have our, you know, even as therapists, we're flawed and yeah. sometimes our mind does yeah. wander. And yeah. I think that's a challenge to not let that yeah. wander because you yeah. want to be there for yeah. them. And so I think it's just as the importance of keeping, being balanced as a therapist for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To be effective, to not. You're off. Thank you, thank you. I had this experience last night, Christine. I was drumming last night. I had a couple, uh, three friends where we had dinner, and uh, later on we were we were drumming together. I've been working too much. <clears throat> I've been working too much. That's just enough. To leave it at that. And so when I began to go into the drumming, I realized last night. I just felt it palpably. This part's missing, Bob. It's not okay. It's not negotiable for you to not be visiting whatever this stirs inside of you. And it's a very deep connection for me, and it would be different for you or for the next person. I really felt that, and it goes into a sense of conviction. As soon as I possibly can, I want to reconfigure my schedule so that it allows for this, because it directly pertains to my ability to be with the client uh, with attention and also create creatively. I just, you know, you just, I, I actually, I talked to uh, one of the friends there. I, I said, do you ever have that kind of palpable feeling? It's just like it's a Concrete feeling like I, it'd be like needing water. I need oxygen. That was the feeling I said with the drumming. I thought, I've gotten too far away from that. Uh, yeah. And I think it takes courage to acknowledge that too, that you're veering away from being balanced yeah. and then taking the time to let go and Thank you you. Know, go inward Thank to you. rebuild that. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that in addition to that, the boulders and the screens are not. They're constantly coming into our own screen, and we've got to continually mm -hmm. clear them out. Thank you. That's absolutely right. It's a, it's a much better image of looking at this. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Ryan, the president of our university, just shared the over stream from uh, earlier in. Um, I really don't like that sound coming out of there. It's uh, distracting me. Um, um, Dr. Uh, Ryan said the boulders in the stream from Carl Jung's earlier image is that you don't take one once and for all. They're constantly coming in there, and it's along the lines of what Christine is saying as well, is that there's a constant attentiveness or vigilance and a clearing out required from moment to moment. I have yeah. a few comments, too, that yeah. people yeah. have been making. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, I'm going to make I'm going to list off a few of the comments that you've all been making um, throughout the time. So this sounds akin to being in process and being aware of it at the same time. And that was from Jim. And then Melissa, um, it becomes part of who you are. And then um, we have Kathleen that says it, it's like in good writing, you have to learn the rules of grammar, yeah. et cetera, first before you can break the rules right or not pay them attention and become a creative writer. Yeah. 
Yeah. And Grant comments and says it builds trust to be involved and want that passion to show, like you were saying about the drumming, how you really want people to have an experience when you're drumming and bringing that as well. How does it build trust? I just want to understand the trust um, part. Showing, <laughs> showing false, that is. is what oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. How weird would it be to come into therapy and be the one who has his, his or her act together as the clients sitting there revealing their vulnerabilities? It's, it's absolutely required. Let me proceed forward. I have a few notes I want to cover here to kind of balance out what I've been focusing on, which is the interior life of the therapist. I want to talk about the interpersonal relationship between the therapist and the client. How are we doing up here? Oh, we're working on that. Um, uh, okay. A couple of things. I want to talk about Carl Rogers, and I want to talk about Heinz Kohut, and, I want to, uh, and we'll, we'll wrap up with this. I, I frame this as, what do clients want? And um, a, anybody that's studied psychology and psychotherapy, theories of personality and so on, has come across Carl Rogers. And it's unfortunate to me because the radicalness of what he talked about can become kind of like a, a Hallmark card. It's just, it's kind of, can become trivialized. And it's so radical what he's talking about. I, I believe if we really internalize what he's talking about and then bring that into the relationship. So let me summarize real quickly. Uh, yeah, first of all, what, does, what do clients want? Uh, I mentioned it earlier. Carl Rogers talked about non-possessive warmth. I was thinking about this this morning. Let me give you just a second to come back to this. There's an there's a, uh, uh, infant researcher, Joseph Lichtenberg, out of Washington, who says that, that, um, that what's required uh, initially in psychotherapy is, uh, is attunement. And he says, attunement will lead to self-writing. I always have this image of a flower that's been stepped on. And if the sun comes up and there's some care, it will self-write like this. And only when the flower has self-righted or when the individual in psychotherapy has self-righted can you do what Lichtenberg calls symbolic reorganization which is really begin to change organizing principles and so on. You've got to somehow get that upright. I think of that with non-possessive warmth, like the warmth of the sun, the warmth of the sun coming down, is that, that that alone can unblock the vital energies in somebody who shut down. For example, think of what shame feels like. Shame is down the river. You think of it, it's just a paralysis of feeling and of, of voice and so on. Being in the presence of somebody who does what Carl Rogers called, he said, somebody prizes you. I prize. I just said I prize you. If somebody prizes you, they don't have to say it. <laughs> it's it's being prized. It's being prized. So clients want we clients. That's all of us. We want to be prized. We want to we want to experience that, and that alone unblocks something. Why is this important to me? In the art form. If I'm cold, there ain't much warmth coming out. So it's important that I stay like vital the blood flow. And that's not a, it's not a, that's like a, that's not in the realm of volition. Oh, I'm going to will to prize you now. <laughs> if you haven't cultivated this, you haven't built it, it won't come. <laughs> Surprising. Uh, secondly, uh, he talked about um, empathy as one of the core conditions of, of effective psychotherapy across all psychotherapies. And somebody mentioned this earlier, and you were right on. I can't remember who it was, but you were right on the money. As I think about that, in order for me to empathize, to really understand what's going on for somebody else, I have got to have some huge you know, There has to be that I have empathy towards myself so that I don't get fouled up in projecting onto my client stuff that I don't like about myself. And it can come out in all kinds of ways. I had a client the other day who I was asking him as he was sitting in session, I, he's got a tremendous amount of guilt. And I said, we, and we've worked long enough together that there's almost like an intuitive, we, don't, we kind of finish each other's sentences. And I said to him, I said, is there hope? And he went, for me to ever forgive myself? And he comes from the Roman Catholic tradition. And I said, I said, does that term, what is it in Catholic? Oh, I said, absolution, you know, where you're absolved. And he goes, yeah, yeah. So we, that was the question. Is there hope of ever being absolved of this? And, and we sat there for a second. Then I went back to my readings and teaching and solution-centered approaches to therapy. Here's the union solution-centered therapist. Um, I said, do you have moments? Do you have moments where there's absolution? And he said, when I sit with you, Bob, it was really quite lovely. And I sat with him. We just talked about that for a minute. And I didn't say much about it. I mean, I received that. I, I think it's true. 
and we just talked about judgment, he can feel with me that there's no judgment of stuff that he's done. And it's not, it's not thought or willed. I, and I just told I can't, I can't find a standpoint out of which I would judge you. And even that was redundant to say that. It's just to kind of acknowledge it and move on. It's just amazing. And whatever that is, I don't take credit for that either. It's not like, oh, Mr. Hot empathy stuff. or <laughs> like that. It's like one does one's work and then what's left there, it just feels like it channels grace. And um, I think that that's, that's what clients want. And, and insofar that's what clients want, that's what we want to cultivate. And I don't, I'm pretty sure that we don't cultivate that in uh, obvious ways. It, 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 it really is a life stance. Several of you have talked about it's, it's about, uh, it's about a way of living, it's about a commitment to a vocation. Finally, finally, um, uh, from Rogers, um, the idea, what clients want is they want us to be real. His term was congruence or genuineness. Years ago, I was sitting at, late at night, I remember this, with a client in session, with one light in the, in the office, and at some point, um, he was an advanced student of psychotherapy himself, and he was sitting with me. He leaned across in the night, looked at me, and he said, Dr. Weathers, do you know what the blankety blank you're talking about? <laughs> and I, I leaned forward and went, yes, I do. And he leaned back. You know, it wasn't necessary for me to say anything, but if I had been lying, that would have been the end of the therapy right there. It was just, it was one of those moments, because it was really ready to drop to another level, and I could... I just felt with him because he's like, you better know what we're talking about here or I'm going to cream you and then leave. <laughs> that's one of those moments I just come to my mind. It's like, it's just razor sharp there, there, there. And I think that's what Carl Rogers was talking about. Dr. Morosner would like to add that what about working with different cultures because certain cultures have different ways to express themselves or not express themselves. Yeah. Yeah, this is that's a very good question. And although we won't be focusing on that today, that could be another presentation. I would love to present uh, to have a dialogue about worldview and cultural sensitivity. I'd really like to do that. But what, but what's implied in what we've already talked about that, that I think pertains to that is this business of Procrustean bed. I am white male Texan. <laughs> <laughs> and all the limitations that are accrued to that. So let me be really, really careful when I'm talking to somebody who's another uh, culture, another race. Um, uh, issues of sexual orientation, gender, uh, what state you came from. I'm from Texas, another country. Um, <laughs> and I, and I, with no disrespect to stud, studying, what my chief interest in graduate school outside of psychology, every time I had elective, it was in cultural anthropology. I absolutely love looking at the world through different perspectives from within, like from within. It, it, I really got to hold lightly, and especially because it's like we're fish in the water swimming around inside the goldfish bowl. We don't even see the water we're, we're swimming in. It's so important for me to be sensitive to that. I see it all the time. I'm a very passionate person. Well, what if my passion is overwhelming to somebody? Well, pay attention, first of all, Bob, and then secondly, inquire into that. How are we doing with this? Because all of us have a fair bandwidth in terms of adjusting our energies, uh, you know, upwardly or downwardly and so on. So, yeah, it's incredibly key. I'm sorry not to spend more time on that now, but it's, it's right at the heart of this. You can't fake cultural sensitivity if you're not sensitive. You can't fake cultural sensitivity if you're procrastinating. <clears throat> uh, Denise also says what comes to mind with Chandler and Grace is that psychotherapy is really personal. Uh, there are invisible <laughs> processes at work when we sit with a client. Yeah, I'm thinking of a poem. It's not going to come to me. I'm too distracted right now. Sorry. Um, let me let me move on. I'm sorry. I, there's a poem and I just can't access it right now. Um, there's some sound in here and that's what's going on. It, it ends up being distracting for this attentively challenged boy. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, finish up by talking just for a few minutes about another uh, master theorist of the interpersonal, Carl Rogers, and what it is that clients want, how each one of those things that he talks about requires transformation within us, is that we're the instruments for mediating warmth. We're the instruments for mediating empathy and genuineness. Uh, Heinz Coed is a psychoanalyst who, uh, about 10 or 20 years ago, uh, psych the uh, International Psycho Psychoanalytic Association had a poll 
and they were asked to say, who's the most influential psychoanalyst since Freud? <clears throat> and Heinz Kohut was the one that was voted as the most influential. He's lesser known for sure, uh, incredibly influential in contemporary psychoanalysis. In fact, psychoanalysis, contemporary psychoanalysis is like unrecognizably, it's, it's, it's unrecognizable in any Freudian roots. Freud is the roots of what's happened now more recently. So Heinz Kohut, I highly recommend. There's a reading list that may be accessible the reference list? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some references there to Heinz Kohut, self psychology, and so on. I want to mention something that he talked about because I think this is another example of how it is that theory implies personal um, dedication. Um, he says there are three different kinds of relationship that clients need for transformation, and any one of these is sufficient. The first one he talks about is twinship the idea that my client needs to feel like that I understand them. It relates to what we talked about earlier with Maslow talking about belonging. You don't have a life. The therapist needs to have an analog to it. As robust a life as you can because you're constantly searching for bridges, for analogs to connect with the client. That's related. That's the kind of thing. You understand me. You get me. You're like me. Clients are kind. Not because we're exactly like them, but we have access to parts of ourselves that are like them. I like the way he talks about this. Is if you don't have this, then forget it. If you don't have this with the client, clients need to know that you're a human being and that they are too before they go any further in the psychotherapy. So it's very basic. The ticket into to psychotherapy, and it really does require having a robust, rich, imaginary, creative, living life. A second relationship that Coet uh, believes is transformative in psychotherapy, he calls an idealizing relationship. That's someone that you can look up to, someone that you can look up to. And there's no reason to be falsely humble. I read a saying, there's not a Chinese, an old Chinese saying, don't be, don't be proud, don't be humble in the, don't be humble in the presence of a master. Don't be proud in the presence of a master, and don't be humble in the presence of a fool. <laughs> is that it? Is that it? I think that's it. It's pretty close. Uh, well, that was the foolish part. There's no reason to be falsely humble. It, I had a supervisor, another supervisor, years ago in internship, Anaheim Child Guidance Center, who said, Bob, one thing for sure, you and all of your cohort are experts in human relationship. That was her human relation. I said, well, what do you mean by that, Pat? And she said, you know more about the and intimacy, what can go right and wrong, than 99.99% of the people out there walk in the streets. And so own up to that and bring that. Bring your expertise. And so this is where the books come in, for example. Constantly citing literature and research and, and poetry and whatever. You know, all of that stuff pertains. The way that I think about that is that's being an expert. How did I put it here? That's, being, that's expert intelligence. There's nothing wrong with being expert intelligent. And, uh, when clients say what, clients will call me Dr. Bob. I, it's an honorific title. It's like it's honoring the fact that Dr. Bob is an expert uh, in human relations. But there's something more required, and that's the third, that's the third part, it seems like to me, of what, uh, the third relationship that Coet talked about. He talked about mirroring, mirroring like a mirror. Uh, it relates to uh, what Carl Rogers talks about with empathic attunement. This, this, my way of understanding this is in order for me to mirror somebody, I need to have the mirror. Oh, that's, I just remembered something. The jazz saxophonist John Coltrane, somebody said, why are you constantly practicing? And he said, he said, I'm just polishing the mirror. Because his idea was that he was telling God through his saxophone playing. And so he wanted to make sure there was a little friction between his fingertips and the divine. That's a nice image, isn't it? Mirroring in the sense of mirroring the mirror as clear and as clean as possible. And the way I think of that is that's something other than just thinking. I think it's like it's really honing one's instinct. Yeah, it's like one's feeling something and then it's just like that. It's like that. Like that. It's 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 like from here where we are to there that we've been talking about. Years ago, I gave a presentation. I don't remember the presentation was. It was some group of psychologists. And somebody came up to me. This happens sometimes in school. Somebody came up and said, Dr. Bob, what books have you read? They wanted to, and it was an honor. It was an honor. There was an appreciation. And I remember inside, I thought, 
I didn't say this. I, whatever I said doesn't really matter. I remember thinking to myself, it's really not about reading books. I understand the question was a genuine question. I'm sure I gave them a list of books, but it's just like it's so not about reading books. But it's a good. It, that's not a bad start. But whatever the presentation was, it was so not about whatever she was asking about about reading books. So I put here, perhaps books are necessary. I believe they are necessary. I think that practicing drums for five years without ever playing it musically was necessary. I think all of the practice that goes into being an athlete, every one of those fundamentals, you practice over and over and over and over again until it's automatic. They're all absolutely essential, but they're not, as, uh, they're not sufficient to the art form of psychotherapy. So I'll go back to Hillman's answer. He said, what's, what's the primary task in... How can we best become uh, an a, a effective psychotherapist? He says it's to cultivate one's art form. And I think we've just blown it wide open, it seems like to me. It's to cultivate, cultivate one's life, like um, Mary Catherine Bateson, to compose one's life as an art form. And it can go any which way. It's inclusive of all of us. It, it, there's no one who's left out of this. It's the part that's easiest to miss in academics. You know, if you think about if, if if you think about the way that ac the term academic is used on the streets, oh, he's just an academic. It would be somebody who's not doing what we're talking about. And there's no reason you don't have to, you don't have to be stupid <laughs> to be an artist. In fact, you have to be brilliant to be an artist. You have to actually be more brilliant because you're bringing in heart and courage in addition to intellect and mind and precision and all of that. There's a final poem I want to finish with um, by the 13th century Persian poet. There's a reference list, too, that you all can access. I'll finish, and maybe we have a minute for questions or something. Um, uh, uh, I heard this poem years ago at a conference, and I went up to the, the woman that she recited it. She was in the audience, and she asked the presenter. She, the presenter was presenting on fairy tales and their use in psychotherapy. And this woman stood up and recited this poem, and I was so moved by it. It was like about 1993 or 4, 15 years ago. And I asked her, please, can I write it? So I wrote down the poem, and this is, I, it, it's in my book. Uh, Today, like every other day, we wake up empty and frightened. Don't open the door to the study and begin reading. Take down a musical instrument. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways of kneeling and kissing the ground. <laughs> so. Thank you all. I'm open for questions, comments, say goodbye, whatever you all want to do. I hope this is helpful. I, the one concern I had about this, this is a postscript, the one concern I had about this is that it would look like it was obscurantist, like I was somehow saying it's not, a, it's not important to study. It's so not that. It's so important to study. Just don't stop short. Don't sell yourself short. Clients don't care. If clients come to see me. They don't know if I'm a psychologist or a psychiatrist or what the heck I am. What they care about, like that guy leaning forward, is do I know what I'm talking about? And you can't fake that. You can't fake that. And so all that you're doing and then this.